Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I, uh, I want to thank the host committee for asking me to uh, speak tonight, uh, specifically Josie and my friend Kristen. It's, uh, it really is an honor and privilege to be here tonight. Uh, as you'll kind of hear, this is the city that I more or less hit bottom in before I found sobriety. And uh, Seattle is a wonderful place to do heroin and hit bottom in. I really welcome you to ever come here and experience that. And um, I, uh, I mean, this is an incredible experience for me just to be here sober. This is the first time I've ever been here sober. And uh, that may mean nothing to you, but it's an incredible experience for me. I'd, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all my friends who specifically came here to uh, hear me speak, which to my knowledge is nobody, but uh, it's always nice to, um, to have dreams. And uh, kidding aside, I'm actually, I mean, like it said, I mean, as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've had the experience of being surrounded by a host of friends. And uh, that's also another incredible thing. Um, if this is uh, your first conference... Uh, I want to welcome you. If this is your first experience at Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to welcome you. Um, I have some disappointing information for you. Uh, just if you're new to these conferences, uh, the spiritual experience is not in anyone's pants. Um, I, uh, <laughs> you're welcome to check mine afterwards, but... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to discourage anyone from having fun, that is. But uh, this is my favorite conference by far. Um, I've had the privilege of, of coming to a number of them. And uh, I like to tell my friends that have not come to Wacky Paw that Wacky Paw is the conference that all the young people that manage to stay sober still come to. And uh, that may sound pretty pretentious, but um, in the fact that I'm in that bit, I, I, I can say that. And uh, I... I guess I'll just get kind of what I, I like to think of as housekeeping out of the way. Um, like I said, I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is October 22nd, 1995, which uh, puts me at 11, a little over 11 years sober, which is impressive if you're impressed by numbers less than 12 and greater than 10. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my home group is the primary purpose group in Toronto, Ontario. <laughs> and I have some friends here visiting from there. And uh, I, uh, I spent the majority of my sobriety in the beginning getting sober in Southern California of which I also have a lot of friends from there. And my uh, sponsor is uh, a guy by the name of Dan F. from the Hill Group. Um, if there's anything that I say tonight, what I would encourage you to do is go to Toronto, attend the Hill Group on Thursday night meeting, find Dan and just kick him right in the balls and say, this is from Bill W. And for your obviously poor sponsorship skills, um, he, he really loves that. And, um, and I love my sponsor. He's this quirky old guy that drinks way too much caffeine for the amount of energy he has. And um, I mean... I like the type of sponsorship that when I'm talking to my sponsor and I'm telling him my bull crap, when he turns away to kind of filter that, I get a little bit afraid that he's going to turn around and slap me. And um, I just kind of like that moment of tension. Um, and, and that's the kind of strong sponsorship that I've been used to. And uh, also, if you're new here tonight and you don't quite know what a sponsor is, regardless of anything you might think that I say, let me assure you that my sponsors have always treated me with the utmost respect and love in Alcoholics Anonymous. And really a, a level of love and respect that at the time I really didn't deserve when I first came in here. And um, that's really the kind of sponsorship that I've experienced in my sobriety. Um, I guess my story. I, uh, I, I was born in the Philippines, and I was born in Manila, and my, my mother was 16 years old at that time. And she was uh, a heroin addict, as far as I know, and uh, had some pretty serious political and uh, wealth affiliations and uh, it was kind of a bit of a, uh, a scandal that I was born in the first place. So I was immediately expedited out of the Philippines and sent to the United States. And I was adopted by, for lack of a better term, two white people. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and in case, <laughs> in case I, I don't get that moment to say it, my parents are incredible people. And as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have a relationship with them today. But they are absolutely batshit. They uh, adopted myself and five other children, all from Asia. So they also have something of an Asian fetish. Um, but uh, they're absolutely marvelous people, and I did not know that until I got sober. Um, I, I grew up in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> it's a wonderful city as well. And uh, I... Um, 
I've always been very, very hypersensitive to social hierarchies. And what I mean by that is I've always known exactly who's at the top of that social hierarchy and who's at the bottom. And my greatest fear was that I would at some point in time get stuck in that middle and just be there. And uh, so I've always known who I was supposed to know and what I was supposed to do. And I've, I've also kind of thought that the schools I went to are what kind of screwed up my life. Uh, my elementary school that I attended, it was apparently very uncool to ever be caught going to the bathroom, uh, specifically taking a crap. This was uh, most commonly referred to as taking a load off your feet. And if you were ever caught doing this, you were endlessly ridiculed on the schoolyard until you either moved out of the city or killed yourself. <laughs> and I, I understood this, so I refrained from using the bathroom for like two years. And after years of constipation, I finally hit that level of popularity where I was invited to that party. And I was 10 years old, and I was invited to Dan Dustin's party, who was ironically dead because of this disease. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to do a buzzkill. But um, I got invited to that party, and uh, appropriately, my first drink was vodka and Kool-Aid. And we started drinking that, and we were running around the neighborhood shooting firecrackers at cars, which is apparently illegal. And um, <laughs> the cops started chasing us, and they cornered us. And as the cops were going around asking us our names, and my friends were all visibly shaken, they came to me, and I suddenly started beginning to feel the effects of alcohol. And I felt a moment of peace that I had never felt before when the cop looked at me and said, what is your name? I said, my name is Richard Head. And he kind of cocked his eye and looked at me, and he said, son, are you trying to tell me that your name is Dickhead? And I said, well, sir, I've always preferred Richard. And uh, he smirked, and he let us walk away. And as we were walking away, my friends were patting me on the back, and they said that is the coolest thing that they have ever seen. And I knew that was true. And at that moment, I had something of a small, sublime realization that that moment came directly as a result of alcohol. And I would be an absolute moron not to chase it to the depths that I chased it because alcohol seemed to affect me in a way that it did not affect other people. And uh, the other thing I've come to find is that I have a difficult time processing my feelings. Um, to be honest, I have absolutely no idea what I'm feeling right now. Um, if the best analogy I've always come up with in terms of my feelings is if you can picture a priest in a speedo with an erection, in as much that my feelings are always grossly inappropriate for the social fabric of any given context. <laughs> And I was constantly overreacting. I mean, definitively, an allergy is an overreaction to a substance. And I had something of an overreaction to both alcohol and feelings. And the thing about that whole processing of feelings is the only thing that seemed to level the playing field was alcohol. And that's exactly why I drank it. And one of the key things about the alcohol is in the beginning, it seemed to immediately alleviate the fear that I had. And I wasn't aware of that at the age of 10, but I came to find whenever I drank alcohol, I was able to do things that I was not capable of doing sober. And more, moreover, at the very beginning, I was one of those social drinkers that immediately passed that invisible line about 20 minutes after I took my first drink. And um, I knew that as soon as I drank, I could not stop drinking. And that was me at the age of 10. And perhaps that's genetics or some sort of, sort of predilection toward alcoholism. But ultimately, it's somewhat irrelevant in the fact that at this moment, I'm sober in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous as a result of the fact that I suffer from the disease of alcoholism. And um, I was one of those people that went down very quickly. Um, I, I did a lot of drugs. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with that. Um, and, and this is Alcoholics Anonymous. And the thing about drugs is what I've come to find in my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is um, that, and you're right, Moshe, once you get sober enough, you do always say Alcoholics Anonymous, not AA. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've come to find about drugs is that there are certain powders, certain vapors, certain things that I can ingest that immediately seem to trigger the phenomenon of craving for alcohol. And ultimately, that is what drugs, how drugs affected me. And uh, by the time I was uh, 14, I had a very serious uh, methamphetamine habit. And um, if you've ever done methamphetamines or perhaps you're on methamphetamines tonight, you, um, you know that it's difficult to sleep at night, so you come up with nighttime hobbies. And... Um, at the time that I was doing uh, a lot of crank, um, the internet had first become public use into consumer homes. And so my hobby is, in the middle of the night, I would get onto the internet and chat with crazy people. And uh, the beautiful thing about the World Wide Web is it's this cyber collective that allows crazy people to simultaneously and instantaneously communicate with each other, much like MySpace.com or MyStalker.com. And, um, and my other favorite habit was uh, to lie. And so it would be 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd be furiously uh, chatting away at the Internet and telling these people these horrendous lies, like that my father would beat me, which was totally untrue. 
and uh, that my mother was a religious nut. And, uh, you know, people being sympathetic and good in nature would say, that's horrible, come run away and live with us. And um, so I did. <laughs> and also, by the way, if you haven't noticed, uh, I have a tendency to kind of talk fast. Um, this isn't because I'm nervous. Uh, in fact, I'm not nervous at all. But ever so often, like when Josie first asked me to speak, she asked me if I was nervous. And whenever I get nervous speaking, I, I just try to remember the fact that pretty much every single one of you here tonight have been a colossal failure in your lives. And, um, <laughs> that uh, always seems to reassure me. But uh, during the height of my using, I was forging uh, fake prescription scripts and cashing in on them. And I was, oddly enough, mixing Demerol with methamphetamines, which essentially makes you say a lot of very stupid things very quickly. <laughs> and uh, when I informed my sponsor about that fact, she said, unfortunately, that seems to have become permanent for you. <laughs> so I apologize that ahead of time. And uh, so I, I was 14 years old. I'd been given the wonderful advice over the World Wide Web to run away from my home and live with people. And uh, I stole a couple thousand dollars from my parents, and I flew out to this little town in Texas called Amarillo. And uh, no offense to anyone who is from Amarillo, but basically the only thing to do there is smoke pot, drink vodka, and go bowling. And I was 14 years old at that time, living the high life of smoking pot, drinking vodka, and going bowling. And I'd more or less re resign myself to the fact that when things got really bad, I would kill myself, perhaps at the age of 18. And um, at this point in time, I hadn't yet accrued that evidence as to why I should hate myself. Really, my, mo my main motivation about wanting to kill myself was this belief that I could do whatever I wanted, and when things got bad enough, I could simply kill myself. And I constantly created these rationales in my head that always allowed me to do whatever I wanted. And suicide always seemed to be that answer to me. Years later, I would accrue the ample evidence as to why I should hate myself. And uh, eventually, I was apprehended by my father, and uh, the thing about this whole line and saying that uh, people were be or my father was beating me is uh, my father kind of went through this whole network of people that I'd met on the Internet, and they had assumed that he was beating me. And he found this out, and he was not really pleased about that, and yet he continued looking for me. And eventually I was apprehended and brought back. And as we were flying back to California, we had a layover in, I believe, Denver. And uh, we were standing at the ticket agents, and he was talking to them, and I had to use the bathroom, so I wandered off to use the bathroom. And my father didn't see me go. And I remember as I came back into the terminal, I saw my father running around with this absolutely desperate, frantic look in his eyes. And for the first time in my life, I suddenly became aware of the fact that my father really cared and loved for me. And immediately after taking this realization, I immediately forgot it. Because to believe that for a moment my parents cared about me aggressively interfered with my ability to act without conscience. If I was for a moment to believe that I was hurting my parents, I would have to be accountable to all the things I was doing, and I could not do that, and so I simply forgot it. And that was the beauty of the alcohol, is this was the thing that allowed me to do whatever I wanted and simply forget about the consequences. And this is also one of those things that apparently separates me from a normal drinker. And um, this was the way I lived my life up until I got sober and probably a good point of time into my sobriety. And as I came back home, my parents sent me to my first rehab. And I went there and uh, the counselors were trying to explain to my parents that I had a very serious drug and alcohol problem. And uh, being any parents, they were in denial. And they felt that my problem was that I wasn't enrolled in a good Catholic high school. So um, they yanked me out of rehab and put me into a good Catholic high school. Um, at the time I hit 15 years old, I hit what was my first bottom in active alcoholism. And I'd reached that point in my life that I thought the only way out of my lifestyle was suicide. And I absolutely despised myself by this point in time. And um, so I attempted suicide for the first time. And when I was doing my original inventory and I told my sponsor about the details of the suicide attempt, he told me that anytime I was speaking, if God forbid I was ever given that opportunity, I should verbatim tell you the details of my suicide attempt because he felt it was a wonderful example of God working in my life at a time that I did not believe in him, and nor would I have wanted him to. And uh, what happened is I'd stolen my friend's van, which was something of a habit, and I'd taken it to his father's business complex, and I was going to kill myself through carbon monoxide poisoning. And one of the beautiful things about Orange County is there's not a lot of tall buildings to jump off of, so this is how I tried to kill myself. And I took a hose, put it in the exhaust pipe, and put it back into the van. And I remember as I was sitting in the van, and the fumes started creeping in, and I lost, I began to lose consciousness. For the first time, I had this moment of peace and serenity steal over me for the first time. And um, I felt completely right with everything that was going on in my life. Ironically, that happened at a moment before I thought I was going to die. But I felt okay with the world. 
And now that I've been sober, I've come to believe that you can only feel like that in the way that I was living if you've completely lost the ability to hope and dream. And uh, that was what I was doing, sitting in a van hoping to die without the ability to hope and dream. And one of the things that happened to me when I first came into this program is I read our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's this one line in that book that really seemed to jump out at me. And that line was pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization. And I remember I'd done a really crappy job hooking up the hose because I came to at one point in time I wasn't, and figured out I wasn't dead. And I took the hose off the bottom of the van and I put it directly into my mouth and started stuck, sucking off it in the hopes that it would kill me faster. And uh, there I was sitting in the van with a hose sticking out of my mouth hoping to die. I knew intimately what pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization was. And uh, then what happened was kind of described to me later. At this point in time, it was a Sunday morning, and again, I'd done a really crappy job hooking up the hose, so I wasn't dead. And uh, this group of people decided to come into work for their first working lives ever on a Sunday morning. They went into the front. This one guy went into the back. He said as he was opening the door, he looked over, saw the van, and had a strange feeling come over him. So he went over and investigated, found me in the van, and dragged me out. And they brought me into the office, and I was in and out of consciousness, and um, they started talking to me. At this point, I was kind of pissed off that they'd screwed up my suicide attempt, so I wasn't really hearing it. But one of the things I would remember is the guy that found me said, sometimes he believes God gives us the opportunity to right what was once wrong. And that years ago, his brother had committed suicide. And uh, that he believed that moment was now for him. And um, I, uh, I remember as my father came in with the ambulance, he was crying. And that was the first time I'd ever seen my father cry. And I remember absolutely despising myself. And I went to the hospital and I was treated for carbon monoxide poisoning. And I stayed in ICU for a week. And the doctors explained what I had done to myself. And they said uh, an average human would have a carbon monoxide level of a two or three. A smoker might have double that, which is like 75% of us are pretty assed out. And uh, when I came in, my level was a 35, which was literally minutes away from dying. And uh, there's no logical reason why I'm still alive. Uh, I like to believe that I'm somewhat on borrowed time. And the reason I like this particular story in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is by no means is this an uncommon story. Pretty much each and every single one of us can think back at a time when we shouldn't be here. I mean, we're very fortunate to be sitting here tonight. There's absolutely no reason most of us should be here. There's an infamous speaker who since passed in by the name of Norm Alpe. And one of the things that he often said was seconds and inches. And what he meant by that was it was a mere seconds and inches that alcoholics that get the fortune to come into Alcoholics Anonymous escape death, if not worse. For me, it was simply what if I had been in the car 30 seconds longer? What if I'd been sitting six inches to the left? It's seconds and inches that I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know that it's by seconds and inches that you two arrived here. And um, at this point in time, my parents realized that if they didn't do something drastic, I would kill myself. So they relinquished custody of me, and I was sent to a long-term rehab, or a long-term juvenile lockdown center. And uh, this was a full-on state institution, and I was there for about two years. And um, for the two years I was there, and uh, oh, also, I forgot to say this. Uh, for the near year that I spent in Seattle, I'm going to kind of deviate. I spent the majority of that time in a blackout. If you recognize me and you are from Seattle, please do not hesitate to come up to me and tell me if I owe you amends, and I mean that quite seriously. Um, but uh, so I was in this long-term rehab or lockdown center, and uh, the most common form of punishment there was demerits. And demerits were 25 minutes spent standing against the wall, and if you moved or talked, you started over. And they're usually given out in groups of three, and on a good day, I got 12. And uh, the other most common form of punishment was getting your ass kicked by 300-pound Samoans. And uh, those were the counselors. And at one point in time, me and my friend high on LSD decided that we wanted to run. So we, uh, we stole a van, and we'd drive a couple state lines. And uh, in a moment of ecstasy, we'd reached uh, Washington, I believe, and I called them up, said, uh, we painted the van, we're in Mexico, fuck you. <laughs> and uh, they said, hold on for a moment. And they got our girlfriends to get on the phone and tell us that if we didn't come back, they'd kill themselves. And so we felt a strange moral obligation that indeed we will feel bad if they did kill themselves. And also we'd been gone for almost a week, and the only thing we'd been eating was a bag of granola that I'd stolen from Safeway, and we were hungry enough to eat our belts. And they said, if you turn yourselves in tonight, we'll buy you Chinese food. So we said, okay. <laughs> and uh, we turned ourselves in. They drove out and got us, roughed us up a bit, brought us back. And when we returned, we had um, an excess of 1,000 marriage, which is roughly 25,000 minutes spent standing against the wall. And for the two years that I was there, I spent three months in solitary confinement, standing against the wall. And um, eventually I got out. And I want to tell you about my last Christmas, um, or my Christmas that I had in lockdown. Um, I'd just been released from solitary confinement. And I made a promise that I would not try to run again. And immediately after that, I tried to run. 
and I was apprehended. I tried to attack someone with a pool cue, and I was put back into solitary confinement for three weeks, of which was Christmas time. And um, that was how I spent Christmas prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I finally was released when I was 18 years old. And I'm actually quite grateful that I was put into this place. Had I not been there, I realized that I would have killed myself. There's something about the alcoholic stubbornness that I'm either trying to kill myself or desperately trying to survive. And there's something about the daily conflict of this place that kept me alive. And for the entire two years I was there, I never achieved anything over 30 days of sobriety. And the other thing that I'm proud of is I graduated high school as a result of being in this place. I was expelled from high school when I was a freshman, and I never again darkened the doors of an academic institution until I got sober. And um, I was also asked not to touch a computer until I was 18 because apparently some of the things I was doing on them were illegal. Um, when I was in this place, I uh, accessed a computer hacked into the school mainframe, and as a result, I graduated high school with a 3.56 GPA, of which I'm still pretty damn proud of. And uh, when I told my sponsor that, he told me that I had to make that right before I returned to school. And I called someone up that was affiliated to this place that I thought would be sympathetic to me. And I told him what I would have done. And after a moment's pause, he said, well, I figure if you were smart enough to do that, you probably could have graduated in high school. Good luck in college. <laughs> and um, I did return to college in sobriety. And I was released when I was 18, and I was absolutely psychotic. Uh, one of the things about this place is it was temporarily shut down by child protection agencies because of the rampant accusations of physical and sexual abuse. And I was absolutely psychotic, and I wanted to kill the people that were in there, and I just wanted to kill myself with a determination that I've never felt before. And at this time, my big uh, goal was to move to Seattle and become a street junkie. And uh, being something of an overachiever, I did that very quickly. And uh, I was in Seattle when Temple of the Dog was a cool band. And I moved out to Seattle, and I also became horribly afraid that I was becoming an alcoholic for some reason, and I tried to stop drinking. And I needed to tell you what I mean by trying to stop drinking. I had literally barricaded myself in the shabby apartment in Seattle right off the Ave. And uh, I was on a strict uh, diet of crack cocaine and methamphetamines, and I was trying not to drink. And what I would do is I would listen to the song Suspicious Minds by Elvis Presley on loop over and over and over. <laughs> absolutely convinced that hidden within the lyrics was a secret message to me. And ironically enough, I was not far from the truth. If you're unfamiliar with the song, the opening words are, we're caught in a trap. And there I was living in Seattle, barricaded in this apartment, trying to quit drinking by smoking crack and doing the amphetamines. And eventually I went absolutely nuts, resigned myself to the fact that I might indeed be an alcoholic and started drinking. And... Um, <laughs> Eventually, I was evicted from that place, and I burned every single bridge that I would have. And the thing about Seattle is I ended up hooking up with all these friends that I had been in lockdown with. And, I mean, we were tight. We had been in this horrible place together, and we were really tight. And in one month time, I burned every single bridge. I mean, every single bridge. I polarized every single relationship I would have, and that's what active alcoholism does. It polarizes every relationship that is sacred to us. And I did that very quickly, and I ended up homeless in Seattle. And this is a beautiful city to be homeless in. And um, I ended up doing things that I never thought that I was capable of doing. And I ended up in this place where I just never thought that I could be at. And the funny thing about alcoholism is when I was 10 years old, it worked. And by the time I was 18, the only thing I was shooting for was apathy, just that moment to not feel anything. And I remember when I came into this program and people told me that I was immature and grandiose, and I was totally offended by this. Just because I'd been trying to relive a moment that I'd had when I was 10 years old did not make me immature and grandiose. It just made me highly nostalgic. <laughs> and I was living in the streets of Seattle, and I finally ended up getting out of here. And um, I, I took off from Seattle with my underage runaway girlfriend, and we were living out of the back of my car. And, um, you know, I converted the back seat to a single bed, and we were kind of really living it up. And uh, I moved out to California. What time is it? And uh, I moved back to California, and this is where I hit bottom. And I ended up getting very involved with a scene. And I think it's important that alcoholics get involved in a scene. And I got very involved in the club scene. And I remember I was kind of at that posh scene in the back room. And the thing is, is I'm a blackout drinker. I've always been a blackout drinking drinker. Being roughly the size of a large owl, I've always drunk past my weight. And... Uh, and, you know, if you're new and you're a blackout drinker, and especially newcomers, I love blackout drinkers. I, I was just constantly in a blackout. And, uh, and I remember near the end of my drinking, I was uh, apparently attending AA meetings and blackouts. Um, 
I, I guess what I would do is I would get drunk, uh, feel guilty about drinking, and attend an AA meeting all in a blackout. And I remember one specific time that I did that, and I attended a Pacific group in Los Angeles. And uh, the Pacific group is a very large meeting in an auditorium. And I remember I just came out of a blackout, like an audible snap, and I was in this auditorium, and I'm like, am I in a ballet? <laughs> and I looked around, and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. So, I mean, if you're like me, and you are now currently coming out of a blackout, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And um, I moved back to California, and I got involved in the scene, and I would be in the, the, you know, that special back room in the clubs, and I would come out of this blackout, and I'd be like, oh, man, I love this song. Why am I naked? <laughs> and, you know, you, you begin to have these kind of increasing indicators that something is not right with the way that you use drugs and drink. And I remember I lifted my face out of this pile of outside issues, and I looked to my friend who I just met 15 year, uh, minutes ago, and I said, do you ever think that other people do not live like this? And he looked at me and said, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Who are you? Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that would work. And it ended up that it didn't work. And I remember my last job that I had, um, this was the last job I had before I got sober. I was working at a company that my father had gotten me a job at. And this was a really nice company. And um, not to scare you, but I was working for a company that built bridges. <laughs> in California, don't worry about here. Um, and uh, this, uh, this one day, I had been done doing ample amount of drugs and drinking, and I'd been up for about 11, uh, 11 days. And <laughs> 11 years, it seems like it. And uh, my boss ironically called me into his office to discuss my job performance. And I came in, had a sudden pain in my neck, cracked my neck, dropped to the ground and went into convulsions in his office while trying to have a talk about my poor job performance. And, and they rushed me to the hospital, and I was treated for a drug overdose. And when I came back, they said, you have two options. We can send you to a rehab, or we have to fire you. And uh, when I was released from that lockdown when I was 18, I promised myself I would never go back to any place like that. And I said, you have to fire me. And so they fired me. I went home, and being the blackout drinker that I am, I got thoroughly hammered went into a blackout, completely forgot about that entire day, woke up in the morning and thought to myself, something's not right. I better get to work on time. <laughs> and I showed up to work on time for the first time ever. And I surprised the hell out of my former employees. And because of my father, a guy took me aside and he said, what the hell are you doing? I'm going to give you this option again. We will send you to rehab. <laughs> And I think I gave him the line, again, when I was 18, I promised myself I would never go to rehab. He's like, I know, you told us that yesterday. And um, I got fired a second time. <laughs> and that was my last job before I got sober. And by the time I was getting, uh, by the time I reached that point that I needed to get sober, I mean, I was literally physically dying and spiritually dead. And I, I had hit bottom. And when I came into this program, I mean, I met guys that had been drinking longer than I had been alive and had been sober long and better, longer than I had been alive. And they had had thing, things in their lives that at the age of 19 years old, I had never had the privilege of having. And they had experienced things that made my worst day out there look like a day at Disneyland. And quite frankly, I think my worst day out there was a day at Disneyland and Mushrooms and Jack Daniels. And I did not immediately identify with the depths of their external bottom that they talked about. But when they said, when I drank, it made me less afraid, I identified with that. And that initial bit of identification is what allowed me to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous at the age of 19. And I hit bottom at the age of 19 simply because I reached that point of painful, undeniable realization that I am not who I think I am. And what I mean by that is the alcohol and the drugs had ceased to work in my life in the way that they used to, because no matter how drunk and high I got, I knew exactly who I was, exactly where I was going, and for some ungodly reason, I was no longer okay with that. And the alcohol had ceased to work in my life in the way that it used to work. And I believe that typifies the bottom that every alcoholic will hit, is simply the fact that the alcohol has ceased to work in your life in the way that it used to. If you have reached that point, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a beautiful place. And after that, I had more my moment of clarity, which I believe is the painful, undeniable realization that there might be another way to life. And I remembered Alcoholics Anonymous, and I came in here. And the thing about coming in here initially is one of my motivations for coming to Alcoholics Anonymous is I had come to find that I could not kill myself. 
I was waking up every morning absolutely disgusted by the fact that I seemed to lack the courage to blow my head off. And I figured that the simple pain of being sober and Alcoholics Anonymous would finally give me the courage to kill myself. And that's one of the reasons that I tried to get sober in this program. And I came here at the age of 19, and again, people treated me with a level of love and respect that I did not deserve. And um, I'm going to talk about uh, all 12 steps as they've uh, worked in my life. And uh, this is simply my own experience. Um, if, if you're working these steps, get your own experience. And um, I'll also make a quick excerpt about uh, the traditions. When I was doing my amends, uh, apparently one of my amends was the old people. And I would have to drive around the circuit speakers in Southern California that were too old to drive their own cars. And this one lady that I would drive around was uh, this lady by the name of Marie. At that time, she had 55 plus years of sobriety. And uh, she had gotten sober when she was in her early 20s, which at the time was completely unheard of for a young woman to come into Alcoholics Anonymous. And she was around when Bill W. was still alive, and the traditions had not really fully been instated in this program. And whenever I was with her, I would glean her for that kind of information. And she told me about the Alcoholics Anonymous that existed before these traditions had fully been in place. And unbeknownst to me, these meetings had not always been the all-inclusive thing that they are. They were highly exclusive and segregated by race, segregated by gender, segregated by religious affiliation, segregated by sexual orientation, segregated by business affiliation, and people were dying because they could not get into meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bill W. and his foresight realized that for, in order for Alcoholics Anonymous to remain and survive, things needed to change and these traditions needed to be put into place. And moreover, he realized that in order out for alcoholics to stay sober, new people needed to get the opportunity to be sober. And this is my understanding of the traditions. And I could talk about all 12 of them too, but that wouldn't really be sexy, so I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> In regards to uh, the 12 steps, uh, step one, uh, I, uh, when I was early in sobriety, I often uh, based very important financial decisions uh, with the idea that I would win the lottery, and um, w which really does not make me an alcoholic. It might be very, very financially irresponsible. But um, I remember this time in sobriety, I'd moved to Europe and I was living in southern Turkey. Every morning I would get up and jog along the coast and I would go to my little corner store and get water. This one day I jogged into the corner store and suddenly realized that the beer was cheaper than the water. And out of the blue, this thought entered my head. You know, you ought to practice getting financially responsible. Why not start here? The beer is cheaper than the water. And for that moment, that seemed like the sanest idea I had thought in a while. And we typify these moments in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous as a mental blank spot. And it goes on to say that those mental blank spots will only be escaped by service to other alcoholics. And I truly believe that those mental blank spots that I've had in sobriety have been as a result of my intensive work with other alcoholics. And um, these mental blank spots come out of nowhere, and that's one of the things that this step one talks about. And in terms of step one, when I came in here, the only thing that was asked of me is, when you find that you drink, do you find that you have little to no control over the amount you drink? And when you honestly want to get sober, do you find you cannot get sober on your own? If you've answered yes to one or two of these questions, you are probably an alcoholic. And the most important question that was simply asked of me is, do you like the way that you are living right now? And that was perhaps the most important question that was asked of me when I first came in here. Do you like the way that you are living right now? And I didn't like the way that I was living. And um, that was ultimately step one for me. And I remember also when I was living in Europe, I had this um, Austrian girlfriend, and we worked at this resort, and uh, you could drink, and it was free, and they kind of encouraged you to do it. And I remember I asked her if she drank, and she said yes, and I, I didn't know she drank because I'd never seen her naked drink on a tabletop. Um, but I said, but why don't you drink all day? It's, it's free, uh, you're allowed to, and uh, you don't get in trouble. And she looked at me absolutely puzzled and said, yeah, but who would want to be drunk all day long? And the first instinctive thought that came to my mind is, what the hell is she talking about? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I continue to be an alcoholic to this day. And then I moved on to my step two. And uh, I remember when I came to step two, I did not believe I could work this step. I said, I I've never had any manner of faith in my life. I, I cannot do this step. And uh, my sponsor often used simple analogies based on, uh, on my past to help me understand the steps. And for step two, one of the analogies he helped me uh, use to understand this was a story I told him of, of when I was in lockdown. And uh, when I was in lockdown, the general rule of thumb was anytime you were at the doctor's office and you saw anything that looked like prescription medication, you stole it. So I was in the doctor's office, and I saw this box of medication. And on the box, it showed two old people walking down the beach hand in hand, and it had the word for the ease of pain and discomfort. So I stole it, assuming it was muscle relaxants, brought it back to the place, shared it with my friends. 
And about an hour later, I suddenly realized that two old people walking down the beach hand in hand and the words for the ease of pain and discomfort, me and my friends had just overdosed on prescription strength laxatives. And uh, for the next couple hours, we turned our will and our lives over to a power greater than we understood. <laughs> and the reason my sponsor used this specific story is he told me that I had lived my entire life based on faith. It was not the quantity of faith that I suffered from, but rather the quality of it. The only evidence I had needed to instantly turn my will and my life over was a picture of two old people walking down the beach hand in hand and the words for the ease of pain and discomfort. And immediately I turned my will and my life over to it with the assumption that it would take me where I wanted to go. And that I came into this program and balked at the very idea of faith. And one of the beautiful things that I understand about this step is that the only requirements that we suggest in regards to your higher power is that your higher power have the ability to restore you to sanity and that it be something you can understand, which means by default, it cannot be you. Otherwise, that's it. The only requirements we place on your higher power is that it be something you can understand and most importantly, it be something that can restore you to sanity. If you're here tonight and you've done these things and you do not believe you've been restored to sanity, I encourage you to look at who your higher power is. And that was simply my experience with this step and then I moved on to my third step. And um, my understanding of having made that decision is that having made that decision, I needed to follow up with vigorous action. And really, my first indicator of having worked a successful third step was doing my fourth step. And um, having made that decision, I followed it up by a vigorous course of action. And, you know, sometimes I can get tricked into believing that um, the third step is a step of complete inaction. I mean, we have these slogans like, um, let go and let God, or... Um, or just hang on, or let go, and all these kind of slogans that would kind of confuse me to believe that I wasn't supposed to actually do anything. And sometimes in an al as an alcoholic, sometimes the best action is no action. But I remember I was going through this traumatic breakup in sobriety, and all breakups in sobriety are traumatic. Um, if you're going through it, I just tell you to get over it. But um, I, I went to my sponsor, and um, you know, I, I told him about this, and he said, you know what, you just got to let go. And I was like, what the hell does that mean? What does that mean? And he said, well, off the top of my head, you can stop stalking her. And um, <laughs> after having let go, my sponsor immediately gave me a course of action that I could follow. And uh, the course of action about my third step was my fourth step, and I began that inventory process. And I started making that list of all those things that have been keeping me sick. And um, I was tricked into my fourth step in the sense that I believed there was a list of all the people that pissed me off. And finally, I would be vindicated for the victim that I had been in my life. And um, I thought it was a very enjoyable exercise until I came to find that there's a fourth column. That fourth column is your part in it. Up until that moment, I had no idea that I'd had a part in anything. I was like the person in the big book that was the jaywalker. If you're unfamiliar with this story, the jaywalker is the person that constantly runs out into the street, compelled to jaywalk until he injures himself at the expense of himself and others. I was like the jaywalker in as much that I was constantly going out in the street, and I had assumed that in order for me to stop getting hit by cars, you all needed to stop driving. And that's how I lived my life. And I made this thing, and I went to my sponsor, and I did my fifth step. And I told him all these things. And um, I remember at the end of it, I, I had one of those sponsors, and he said, now tell me all the things that you didn't write down. And I, there were things I hadn't written down. I mean, I had walked in there with the firm belief that I was not going to tell him anything, uh, everything. And specifically, there's a lot of the things that had happened to me. You know, I was locked down, a lot of the things that had happened to me in Seattle that I was completely ashamed and humiliated about. And I did not believe that I needed to tell anyone about these things. And at the end of that initial inventory, I suddenly realized that if I wanted to actually get this thing, I needed to come clean with another human being. And I told him these things. And at the end of that final inventory, my sponsor got uncharacteristically quiet. This is a sponsor that called me ass hat because he felt I didn't know my head from my ass. <laughs> and he said, for what it's worth, I'm sorry these things happened to you. Perhaps in a perfect world, these things wouldn't really happen to anybody. Unfortunately for you, these are no longer an excuse to live the, the, the way that you are living. And at that moment, I suddenly became accountable for everything that had happened in my life. And then I knew I could change. At that point, I had believed that everybody else needed to change in order for me to get sober. And what I came to find out is that nobody needs to change in order for me to get sober. I'm the only person that needs to change. And having found a higher power, I suddenly began to realize that I could change. And that was a beautiful realization. And for the first time, I was free. And for the first time, I felt comfortable being me, even though I had no idea who that was. And I moved on to my sixth and seventh step. And my sixth and seventh step were simply coming to that easy realization that I have such a spiritual defect of personality that nothing short of divine intervention will relieve me of these defects of character. And um, I borrow heavily from this guy named Sandy B on the East Coast of the United States, 
but I often relate my defects to things that I think are useful today. Things such as like, well, what I like to believe is spiritual pride. And, um, you know, today I sponsor a lot of jackasses. And um, in spite of my best efforts to kill them, some of them actually stay sober. And ever so often they'll get like a one year and they'll get up in front of people and they say something semi-intelligible and they'll clap. And, you know, I'm sitting there and as they're clapping, I'm thinking, you know, the reason this person is sober is because they have a sponsor. And, uh, you know, that sponsor happens to be me. So really all the credit that you're giving my sponsor you should be coming to me. <laughs> That's my definition of spiritual pride. What I'm looking for is gratitude. What I'm looking for is the gratitude that for at that moment I have something worth giving away. What I'm looking for is the gratitude to believe that someone actually wants what I have. What I'm looking for is the gratitude that I am a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's what I'm looking for. My experience with the six and seven step has been about transforming these defects of character that I've spent my entire life living on into something that can be of use to another human being. And that's what I've come to find that my six and seven step have been. And this is an ongoing process throughout sobriety. And I moved on to my eighth step and started making the list of the people that I had hurt that I needed to make amends to. And then I moved on to my ninth step. And like any good alcoholic, I tried to make my a ninth step amends, I think, in my first three months. And um, I went on this crazy road trip. And I went out to this place that I'd been in lockdown. And I was trying to make amends to this guy. And um, I think the end of that amends, I said, watch your back, fuck you. <laughs> and... Um, after doing that, I met up with these people that I had been in this place with, and quite literally, we began plotting how we could kill this person that night. And I mean, literally, we were planning how we could kill them. And in the midst of this planning, it suddenly occurred to me, perhaps this is not what they talked about when they said, amending my hurts to other people. <laughs> and I also was lucky enough that I brought another member of Alcoholics Anonymous that was less sober than me, but he just stood there open mouth. And he said, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> and um, we got out of there. And at that time, I did not understand the importance about making those amends. After I did them, I began to understand that importance. And um, one of the amends I'm going to talk about is the amends I had to make to the people that saved my life when I tried to kill myself. And um, I also remember questioning as to how you make amends to yourself. And I think everybody questions how you make amends to yourself. And um, I used to attend this meeting at the Compton Alano Club on North Bullis Street. And um, I made the mistake of asking a member there, how it is that you make amends to yourself? And um, this is what he said to me. This is not how I talk. But he said, motherfucker. And, um, you know, I listened up because I know in Alcoholics Anonymous, we precede every single spiritual revelation with a personal insult. <laughs> and he said, mother effort, what, it is, what is it that you think we are doing in this program besides making amends to ourselves? And he directed me to the ninth step amends, the promises. And in those promises, it said that we will know a new freedom and a new happiness. And I, I can think of no better way to make amends to myself than to have that kind of life as a result of making amends to other people. And um, the amends that I made was to these people that had saved my life. And this was a gimme amends. I mean, there was absolutely nothing wrong that could go with this amends. All I had to do was find the people that had saved my life, thank them, and tell me what my life was like as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I put that off for six years. And I reached this point in my sobriety where I was going through a spiritual crisis, and it suddenly occurred to me that I had not made this amends. And so I went about and tried to make this amends. And I, I looked all over this place, and I could not find them. And I got into my car, and I said a very simple prayer. And I want to thank my friend Alonzo for this prayer, because that's who I learned it from. And the prayer goes as following. I said simply, God, I think it's really important that I make this amends. If it be your will, please give me a sign and make it really obvious, because I'm really freaking stupid. <laughs> and immediately after saying this prayer, I kid you not, the thought occurred to me, check one more building. And I went into that building, and sitting behind the reception desk was one of the ladies that had been there. And not quite willing to give it up, I said to her, the reason I'm here is because years ago my brother tried to kill himself. <laughs> and she looked at me and started crying and said, no, it was you. And she came around the, uh, the counter and hugged me and took me back into the office where I would talk to the other people that had saved my life. And it was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in sobriety. And I told them what my life was like, and my life was good as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that moment, my spiritual crisis ended because I knew I had a God in my life that I could do business with. And um, that continues to be my experience in sobriety. And really, that is the experience that you can have. Nothing spiritually is withheld from you if you do this thing in the way that it's talked about. And that's the beautiful thing about this program. You're not going to get everything that we talk about. You're not necessarily going to get that awesome job, that awesome spouse. You're not going to necessarily get everything that we talk about. But nothing spiritually is withheld from you if you do this thing the way that we talk about. And um, I love that about this program. 
I remember when I came in here, I, I, I wanted to have a girlfriend. I mean, I wanted to get sober, but I also wanted to have a girlfriend. And, you know, you know I'm an alcoholic. I always wanted to date the most popular girl in treatment center. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I told him about the fact that I, I, I could not have any sort of romantic relationship with people. And my sponsor directed me to this part of the big book that says some of us will not be able to have romantic relationships with people. But we will be okay because we'll fill our lives with service to other suffering alcoholics. And he pointed it out with much enthusiasm. He said, you will be okay. And I was like, that is effed up. I'm, <laughs> I am 19 years old. I am still trying to get the tip wet, and that's what he's telling me. And um, thankfully, uh, I stayed sober. And um, I'm hoping I'm going to get to talk about what my life is like today. Yeah, I'm talk about that. But uh, I, I also made my amends to my parents. And it, it took me years to be able to even talk to my parents. And today I have an incredible relationship with my parents. I mean, an absolutely incredible relationship with my parents. Um, I, uh, I recently uh, had a book written. And in the book, one of the stories is my story. And um, as a result of this book being written, um, they had to interview my parents and myself. And so I was sitting with my parents and uh, my sister and the author of this book, and they were talking with my parents. And um, my, that author asked my parents simply, like, um, what it was like today. And they said, we will be forever grateful for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that gave us our son back. And uh, my mother started crying, my sister started crying, I started crying, the author started crying, and it was just a big ball of thumb. But... Um, you know, I had polarized every single relationship that I came in here with. If you want to find respect in life, if you want to find respect in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're looking at us and you're wondering how it is that we have that respect, go out there and amend the relationships that you've spent your entire life destroying. Go out there and amend those relationships and rectify those things, and I can assure you, you can have what we have. And I moved on my, my 10th step, and the 10th step is simply that buffer zone that allows me to screw up and still stay sober. Because the fact of the matter is, I'm a human being, and I'm an alcoholic. I mean, human beings are sloppy. We have material to wipe our ass after we take a crap. We are sloppy, sloppy things. And we are continuously going to make mistakes. And as a result of this step, I can make mistakes and stay sober if I'm willing to make amends promptly after I make those mistakes. And the thing about this step is I have continuously be fa been faced with those moments where I needed to give up everything I was for the hope of something that I could be. And um, that's what the 10th step has been for me. And I moved on to my 11th step. And um, I'm going to tell a short story about the Lord's Prayer at the end of the meeting. This is not about what we should pray at the end of the meetings or whether we should hold hands. This is simply my own story about the 11th step. At some point in my sobriety, I had stopped saying the Lord's Prayer at the end of the meeting for stupid principles, and I had stopped holding your hands. And I went to my sponsor, and I told him about this. And instead of coming down on me, he said, yeah, I used to do that too. And what I came to find is that I had spent my entire life disconnected. And when I said that prayer and held your hands, for that moment, I felt connected to another person. Far be it for me to avoid any moment that I can be connected to another human being when I have spent my entire life disconnected from other people. And um, at that moment, I didn't necessarily agree with them, but I went and attended my next meeting. At the end of the meeting, when we were supposed to hold hands, I remembered my sponsor's voice. And I took a hold of your hand, and I said that prayer with you, and for that moment, I was connected. Far be it for me to avoid any moment when I can be connected, when I spend nearly my entire life trying to be disconnected. And um, again, this is not a story about what we should pray at the end of the meetings. This is simply my own experience with prayer. And... Um, I've come, to, I've come to find that it's that prayer meditation that often pulls me out of those moments where I cannot get a hold of another alcoholic. And uh, it's through that prayer meditation that my own relationship with my understanding with God has grown. And then I moved on to my 12th step. And the 12th step is basically what happens when we get this thing. And um, I remember uh, a little bit into my sobriety in my first year, this guy that I used to drink with decided to get sober. And he came to me because I knew I was an Alcoholics Anonymous, and he asked me to help him get sober. And um, so I started bringing him around Alcoholics Anonymous, and the guy's still sober. And one of the things that him and I did in early sobriety to stay sober was do H&I panels. And we would go into these uh, juvenile institutions, much like the place I was in, and we'd share our own, our own experiences. And my friend would often credit me with his sobriety when he would talk. And at the end of his panel, sometimes the kid would, kids would ask us questions. And um, the kids would often ask me how they felt. In fact, one of those kids is Caroline, I might add, who's here tonight. And um, she's one of those people I met on an H&I panel. Um, and uh, we, uh, when they would ask me how I felt about getting this guy sober, 
in, in retrospect, at the time that I was trying to get him sober, the only th- reason I was hanging out with him is because I wanted to drink again. I hated Alcoholics Anonymous. I hated you. I hated hearing about your freaking miracles. I didn't want to do the steps. I hated my sponsor. He was a very mean person. And I felt that he was insensitive and t- should take some kind of training about that. And essentially, I was sneaking out the back door of Alcoholics Anonymous. But when my friend approached me and asked him to help me get sober, I was stupid enough to believe that I had to. So I, I started bringing him to those meetings and listening again because I needed to translate what you were saying to him. And I started working my steps with more diligence because I thought it would be embarrassing if he surpassed me in the steps. And essentially, I started doing all the things that I needed to do in order to stay sober because of this person. And, and the thing about it is, is he could have asked any member of Alcoholics Anonymous to do exactly what I had done, and they could have done it just as well, if not better. Uh, the miracle is I did it, and as a direct result, I stayed sober. And at the time that he thought I was saving his life, he was quite literally saving mine. And that's the miracle of this step is my actions superseded my intentions and I got to stay sober. And I believe that's the 12-step in its best form, and I've continued living that today. And uh, Bill and Bob were really big into the idea of cyclic momentum. That's why our logo is a triangle surrounded by a circle. It's the idea that we'll want to once again come back full circle. And what I mean by that is the very things that I need to do to stay sober today are the very things that I love. The very things I do to stay sober today are the things that I take the most pleasure out of. And that's an awesome deal to understand that these things that I have to do to live this life are the things that I love. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm here tonight surrounded by like 100 of my closest friends. And I have a life that's beyond my wildest imaginings. And, um, you know, I, I came in here believing that I could not have a relationship at all. And uh, to the day, five years ago, I showed up to the Wacky Paw in Colorado and moved out to Canada on a harebrained scheme to work for an organization running an art studio for people with developmental disabilities. And um, I was uh, profiled by uh, a local news agency as a Canadian making a difference in the city of Toronto. And during the interview, they found out that I was actually American and uh, cut the interview short. Uh, <laughs> later, they edited it, and it never came out that I was American. Um, but that's kind of one of the things that I've gotten to do in sobriety. And uh, when I was working at this place, uh, about two weeks after working there, I saw this girl, and I thought she was completely out of my league, so I didn't talk to her. A little bit later, she approached me and asked me out on a date. And uh, last September, we celebrated our third uh, wedding anniversary. <laughs> and... Um, I mean, I'm living the, like, uh, Canadian-American dream. I'm a short Asian guy married to this tall, brunette Catholic high school teacher. <laughs> and uh, she's, she's not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, but she seems to have an understanding of us. She's a member of Al-Anon, which, if you're unfamiliar with that, is a program for the people that like to control and enjoy their alcoholic. And um, <laughs> thank God for Al-Anon, because I can assure you, I would not be here by myself over New Year's Eve if not for the program of Al-Anon. And... Um, I uh, I remember when I got married, and I got married uh, kind of in this organization that I work for because that's where we met, and there's this huge barn that, that we renovated, and uh, this was our wedding, wedding reception. At the high point, there's about 300 people, and like 50 of those people were friends of mine from California, friends and family. My whole family was there, and during the first dance, I had this kind of moment. Uh, well, during emotionally overwhelming moments, I think, what would this look like if it were a movie? I assume I do this because I'm self-absorbed and neurotic. But um, if it were a movie, the groom and the bride would be standing there having their first dance surrounded by, you know, the 300 closest friends and family. And, uh, you know, the music would be playing in the background. They'd be having that dance, and the groom would think to himself, this is perhaps one of the best days of his life. And um, they would be dancing, and the music would kind of slowly reach that crescendo and get louder. There'd be a slow whiteout, and then just complete white out and the credits would roll and everyone would assume everyone lives happily ever after. And see, I, I've been sober and married long enough that I know that nobody lives happily ever after. <laughs> but what I can say about my life today is that aside from those moments that I've treated people poorly, I have very few regrets in how I've lived my life. I have very few regrets in how my life has ended up today. And if that's my happily ever after, I really cannot think of anything better. And um, I think my time's running out. I know that people want to dance. Um, you know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous dances. I got sober getting uh, dancing at the Anaheim Alano Club, MWA, the Snake Pit, and uh, Inner City Cherry. And these are the places that I danced at. And there is nothing like an Alcoholics Anonymous dance. It's the only place that you're going to find some dude doing the crip walk. And then some middle-aged guy wearing leather that's a biker getting serious sexy time that I want to fuck you like an animal. I mean... <laughs> There's nothing quite like that. Sober, that's what's going on. So I want to let you guys be able to dance. But uh, I'm going to share kind of a short story about uh, the last AA dance that I went to. I was speaking at this big conference out in Canada, and after the conference, we had the dance. And um, 
The thing is, is I, I kind of love and hate dances. I don't know if you've seen the movie Airplane, but there's a scene in the movie Airplane where they're at the bar, and suddenly the, the music from Saturday Night Fever comes on, and all these crazy people start dancing. That's sometimes how I see AA dances. But I, I've really grown to love them. Anyway, during this dance, I was kind of sitting there, and I, I was looking over this mass of my friends. And, uh, you know, sometimes music has a way of speaking things that I cannot actually express myself. And as I was looking over the crowd, I spied my friends, and I saw them having this absolutely wonderful time. And I thought how grateful I am to have these people in my life, to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, how grateful I am. And literally at the moment that I was thinking that, the lyrics that floated across the room were, there's, um, oh, Jesus, I just forgot. <laughs> it was simply, um, this feels like home. And that was the layers that floated over the room as I was thinking that. And really, I can think of no better words to sum up my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous than this feels like home. And um, if you're new here tonight, again, I want to welcome you. This is the most awesome thing I've ever experienced. Um, I know today that if I want to continue to experience, this is, what I need, this is where I need to be. This is where I want to be, and that's a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're new here tonight, um, what I would simply say is choose again. And what I mean by that is when I first came in here, the only things that I wanted to choose hurt myself and hurt other people. And today, as a result of doing this thing, I can choose things like love. I can choose things like compassion. I can choose things like hope. These are the things that I can choose today as a result of being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. So simply choose again. Thank you for letting me be here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.